And this prophecy of Joel of three chapters has engaged our attention quite a bit recently. Now we appreciate the background that Brother Len Grice had for this subject yesterday in his study on Hezekiah and Sennacherib. I found it very engaging and very helpful. And years ago, many years ago, a talk by Brother George Tabak on Psalms 83 about the difficulties Israel would face against other nations has been a very helpful predicate for shaping up our understanding of the prophetic events. And more recently, Brother Albert Gabarowski of Detroit has given a very engaging lesson just about a week and a half, two weeks ago uh, in Detroit. And those are three very nice services that if you ever have the opportunity to hear or rehear would be very helpful. Joel is going to take our minds and our attention down to the last circumstances closing the gospel age harvest and introducing the kingdom. Now we're at the threshold of the kingdom. Some brethren might guess there'd be 15, 30 years away. Our guess would be about halfway between. But whatever you think of the nearness of the kingdom, it is that near. We're at the closing experiences of the harvest. And as we observe the affairs that are preparing Israel to take a leading role in the kingdom, we can observe things on the scene of politics and unfolding prophecy that are quite engaging. And Joel is going to be about that subject. Now, Joel is one of 12 minor prophets that you all know. Now to recite these 12 minor prophets in sequence is a little challenging. There are a few tricks that make it uh, less difficult for us, but here's a listing of all of the 12 minor prophets. And we have them broken down into three categories. That is by the, uh, the empire that was dominant in the Middle East at the time that these minor prophets spoke. Now you can see from the screen that the first six minor prophets all lived during the period of the Assyrian Empire. Now we've highlighted three of those in particular, Joel, Micah, and then over to the right, you have the major prophets. And of those, Isaiah also was contemporary with Joel and Micah. Now, time allowing, we're going to talk about Joel and Isaiah and Micah. And these contemporary prophets are looking at the same experiences unfolding in their day and their prophecies, all of them are predictive of the closing issues of the harvest in our day. Now, after the Assyrian empire came the Babylonian and the Persian, we won't get into those prophets so much today, although they do also have relevant things about the subject, but time will disallow us from going there. Now in Joel, these three chapters, what you have is Joel's prophecy in chapter one, outlining the problems that the Assyrian empire has brought and is bringing to Israel. That is in Joel's day. Now it's part prophecy, part resume, because what Joel is speaking about are the advances of the Assyrian empire into both the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. And some of those had already occurred. And the fourth one was pending. Now, when you go to the very first chapter, very first chapter, we're not going to read all of the verses, but we will highlight verse four. It's on the screen in front of you. And Joel says, that which the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Now we've highlighted in bold words there, the four kinds of locust invasions that Joel is referring to. Gnawing, swarming, creeping, and stripping. Now you notice that he puts some of these into the past tense. Now, these actually do refer to four different Assyrian invasions of the nation of Israel in Joel's day. And here we have on the screen at the bottom, a list of the four kings of the Assyrian empire that have imposed 
those four invasions upon Israel. Now to the right, we've listed the scriptures that actually list the name of each one of these Assyrian rulers. And you'll notice that the very last one, Sennacherib, that's the one that Brother Len Gray spoke about yesterday as a picture of the final invasion of Israel, the one that is recorded prophetically in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, I think Brother Len is correct about that conclusion. A number of brethren have seen this point for some years. So that suggests, if that is correct, that maybe the first three invasions refer to things that Israel experiences in modern times that are before the problem of Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, we'll go to the next slide and you'll see that we have three dates listed there. 1948, 1967, and 1973. And then below that, Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 will be the final conflict that will take us into the kingdom with the ancient worthies being raised to help Israel in their last debacle. Now we have headed this column, Psalms 83. And Psalms 83 is indeed where a prophecy comes of, maybe, maybe it's not a prophecy, but a recounting of final difficulties that Israel received in old times that refer prophetically to the final difficulties Israel passes through in modern times. Now you'll notice in Psalms 83 verse four, this is the point of the invaders of Israel. This is what they wish to accomplish. It says, come and let us cut them off, cut off Israel that is, from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Now, if they're going to cut off Israel from being a nation, that suggests Israel is a nation. And that of course occurred for the first time in modern history in 1948, when Israel was restored to their national independence. Now following 1948's declaration of independence, you know that the Arab nations that surrounded them invaded Israel with a hope to destroy the fledgling nation. They even asked some of their Arab neighbors and friends, leave Israel, then we will invade, and then you can come back in and take your old lands when Israel's destroyed. Well, of course, God protected Israel. The fledgling nation, even though they didn't have much in the way of military stability. And then in 1967, 19 years later, there was another advance by the Arabs against Israel and that was the Six Day War. And then finally, six years after that, Egypt and Syria combined and then other allies joined in to try one last time to destroy Israel. And they almost succeeded. In 1973, that was when Israel was in the greatest jeopardy. They were taken by surprise. They were taken not fully prepared. Now the prime minister at the time was a woman. That was Golda Meir. And subsequent to the experience and after Israel did survive, I think by God's grace. In the aftermath, there were political problems and she felt it wise to resign because she felt at least in part that she had not prepared adequately. Now, I think she'll go down historically as an extremely noble person. What other world leaders would resign in light of a self-feeling that maybe they had not served as good as they should? I think that's a very noble quality of hers. But the next invasion is going to be even more problematic for Israel. And that's the one in Ezekiel 38. But by the time we get to Ezekiel 38, as many brethren have observed, we no longer have a coalition of Arab enemies against Israel. In Ezekiel 38, we have not Semites against Israel as Arabs would be, but we have Japhethites and we have Cushites. Uh, 
and, uh, and we'll see that a little more in more detail subsequently. So I will propose that maybe these four waves of Assyrian invaders in Joel, the first chapter, actually refer to the last four battles that Israel has to undergo in defense of her national existence. In 1973, they almost lost. I think that's a little precursor of what's going to happen in Ezekiel 38. They will almost lose, but they will be spared. And that's the Sennacherib battle. Now, you remember Brother Len mentioned yesterday that God spared Israel so miraculously that the invaders didn't even come into the city. And I think that's the way it will be also in the final defense of Israel. <clears throat> now, I want to make a point that these dates, 1948, 1967, and 1973, are not random. These are not random dates that happen to be in those years. I believe there is actually a meaning to the date of each of these experiences. Now, we start with 1948. And in 1948, you may remember that that is a period of 70 years after Israel began to return to their land. Now, the brethren customarily date that at 1878 because the first Jewish colony at Petatikva was reestablished in that year. And even the very first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, when he was asked later, when did the return of Israel to their land begin? Went back to the same year, 1878. <laughs> we do it for theological purposes. That's the end of the Jewish period of diaspora in the 1845 years. I think that's sound. But he didn't know about that. He did it for political purposes, just observational. He observed that Petatikva was the first reestablished Jewish colony in modern times. So 70 years of restoration of Israel into their national existence. Well, that has to trigger a remembrance in our minds that way back in the Old Testament, when Israel lost their national independence, when Babylon ruled the world for 70 years, we have the same number. So I don't think 1948 was a coincidental date. It could well have been two or three years one way or the other. I think 1948 prophetically matches 70 years of recovery just as they had 70 years of going down. But there's more. If you look at Israel today, you will see the Wailing Wall that we have on the screen and then the Temple Mount is on the other side but you don't see a temple, at least not a Jewish temple. You know that was destroyed by the Babylonians first and then later by the Romans, a rebuilt temple. But what you do see is that golden dome. That golden dome is a tribute not to Christianity, not to Jewishness, not to Abrahamic covenant through Isaac, <clears throat> but rather to the Islamic view that the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled through Ishmael. That houses the rock on which they claim Abraham offered Ishmael. Now, that's a fundamental distortion to the whole point of God's plan. And I think that as respects natural Israel, that was a, a setting up on the holy site of an abomination, spiritually speaking. Now, when did that abomination begin to be built? Well, according to Wikipedia, one of two dates, but it appears the most likely date, was 688 AD. Now, I've got on the screen here, Daniel 1131. Daniel 1131 is a scripture that we use about the desecration of the Christian church and specifically of the, the ransom given by our Lord. Uh, the time when the abomination of desolation would be set up. And I think that abomination is the abomination of the mass. And that was in five. Uh, and, and then the papacy set up in power after that. And total, both of them finally were accomplished by 539. And that takes us the beginning of 1260 years uh, to the end of papacy stranglehold in Europe. Now, that's wonderful. But I think if you flip the coin on the other side, you'll find a parallel application, not for spiritual Israel, 
but for natural Israel. And if you begin that in 688, when that abomination was put up on the holy site, that will take you 1260 years later to 1948. So I think that date, 1948, is not random. Now, there's one more I will just add. We've talked about it in past times, and that is the great flood that swept the earth in Noah's day. When the flood was uh, receding and they came aground, but they still looked out, the curse was still out there. I think that's a picture of the end of the age when finally the ending period of the gospel age arrives in 1874. And you can mark exactly in the account, 74 days later, they looked out from the ship and they saw in the distance, the top of the mountains for the first time. Now that's an expression, the top of the mountains that's used in Micah, the fourth chapter verses one and two to represent the nation of Israel in the establishment of the kingdom. Now Israel is not yet the kingdom of God. They are, however, established in the top of the mountains and will become the kingdom of God in time to come. So the first visible sign that you and I have looking out on the mountain kingdoms of this world, that the kingdom is indeed on the way unequivocally is seeing the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in the top of the mountains in 1948. So by all these three means, and there are more, but we'll limit it here. 1948 is not random. Now we move on to the next one, 1967. There is a prophecy in Daniel, the eighth chapter about the cleansing of the sanctuary that takes us uh, from the beginning of the 70 week prophecy in Daniel all the way to the mid 1800s. Now, William Miller thought that ended in 1843. I tend to agree with him. Other views say it ended in 1846. But either way, that's a, a very engaging prophecy that takes us to the crescendo of the Adventist movement preparing for the harvest. I think that's right. But when I was a young budding teenager, I was at the convention in Phoenix in, I think it was 1968. And an elderly brother, elderly Greek brother, I believe his name was Nick Curios. Now he was elderly at that time, so he's long since gone. He was a very humble brother and I was just a teenager. So he could speak to me, I was just a young kid. And I, he approached me with a big smile on his face. The 67 war was over. And as a Greek brother, he knew his Greek history. And he knew that in Daniel the eighth chapter, the next episode recorded in Daniel eight was, well, it's prior to the 2300 years, but a fundamental episode was when Greece ran into the Persian empire and defeated it. And he knew that that began with the battle of Granicus in 334 AD, 334 BC, excuse me. And he knew that 2300 years later, take you to 1967, when the temple mount literally was back in Jewish hands after it had been in Jordan's hands for some time. Now, I, the main fulfillment of the 2300 years is spiritual, of course, but what he was suggesting and what engages our attention is that there is a parallel fulfillment of the 2300 years to natural Israel also, just as there was with the 1260 years leading to 1948. So I think 1967 is not a random year. And then the next one, 1973, the year that Israel almost lost and had to be spared by our Heavenly Father. 1973, well, let's see, is there a parallel that shows this to be meaningful? Well, you know, those 70 years that we talked about leading to 1948, the 70 years of the Babylonian Empire, and in our day, the 70 years of restoration of Israel, Turns out when you go back to that 70 years in the Old Testament, that 25 years later saw the completion of the temple preparatory to the full reestablishment of Israel 
with the completion of the walls of New Jerusalem 70 years after that. 25 years after 1948 take you to 1973. There is a prophetic way that each one of these dates are meaningful. And I think these are not random. And therefore, when I look at Joel, the first chapter, and I see three invasions of the Assyrians that were difficult for Israel, but Israel survived, leading to a fourth final invasion of Israel from which they could not rescue themselves, but God will intervene and did back in Joel's day. I think that's predictive of the final assault on Israel in, uh, in Ezekiel 38. Now, is it likely that there's going to be another war of conquest against Israel? I don't think so. I thought there was, I thought it was likely, but in recent years, I'm realizing that it doesn't seem so likely. Now from 1948 to 1967 was 19 years. And then the next one was six years later. Do you know it's already been 48 years since we have had an attack on Israel to destroy them as a nation? I think that indicates the motion is going the other way. And beyond that, now we'll go to another slide. We've got another development on the scene, and that is this one, the Abraham Accords. And the Abraham Accords, we'll go back to the other slides in a moment. The Abraham Accords took me by surprise. Now, the name I responded to, when the news came out about the Abraham Accords, I think, I hope it brought a smile to your face as it did to mine. The whole world has their attention focused on Abraham. And of course, the Abrahamic covenant is vital to our faith to bless all the families of the earth. The Abraham Accords brought into accord with Israel two of their Arab enemies and seems to show that the, in, the, 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 the motion is going in the other direction. Now we're gonna go back to those two slides we passed over. Here's Psalms 83. And this is the Arab conflict against Israel in 1948, 67 and 73. Now, these are the nations that are referred to in Psalms 83. And for time, we're not going to go th through Psalms 83 in carefully. But the point that we want to make is that these nations are, contempor are, are nations adjacent to Israel and surrounding Israel. Now, there's all the names from Psalm 83. And here are some of the nations in current day that are the fulfillment of those nations. There was Egypt, uh, there was Syria, there was Iraq, there was Jordan, and all of those nations joined together in an attack on Israel in 67, and it, excuse me, 48, 67, and 73. But now, now they're all either incapacitated or have made peace with Israel. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the Abraham Accords that have just come about have brought even more of the Arab nations into harmony with Israel. Now, I want to focus here on these nations that were part of the accord. It was the United Arab Emirates and it was Bahrain. Now, you'll see Bahrain is so small you can hardly even see it on the map. There's a little bridge that takes about 10 miles from Saudi Arabia to Bahrain. The real prime mover here was the United Arab Emirates, and they decided it's time to get past the, the difficulties and make an agreement with Israel. Now, what really motivated them was surprising to me, 40-year-old Jared Kushner serving as an agent for President Trump in his waning months and time of his presidency. And Jared Kushner, engagingly to me when he was just a boy, I mean a teenager. He knew, his family knew the Netanyahu family from Israel. Everything okay? So there were connections already made between Netanyahu and Kushner. And I think this paved the way for his influence in the Middle East. And he described the process as hitting a wall you try this avenue of diplomacy, you hit a wall. You try another avenue, you hit a wall. And finally you find 
a wall that will break down. And that's what they did with the United Arab Emirates. And then Bahrain added to that. Oman is sympathetic. Kuwait, not so sympathetic, but both Oman and Kuwait have already had for decades trading negotiation and trading relationships with Israel. Iraq, as you know, has already been subdued by the Iraq war, you know, the first, second Gulf War. And Saudi Arabia is in spirit, in sympathy with these agreements. Otherwise, their client countries like Oman, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, would not be disposed to be making agreements with Israel. So the whole thrust, the whole motion seems to be going in terms of making accords with Israel. Now you already know, going back to, uh, going forward a little bit, that Egypt had an agreement with Israel as early as 1978, formalized in 1979. You know that Jordan, some years later in 1994, made a peace agreement with Israel. Now we have the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, we'll show that on a map shortly, Malawi and Morocco. Now these nations have, have already been brought into accord. Sudan is a place that festered anti-Israeli sentiment and terrorism for years. Now, Malawi is not so well affected here, but it's at least a representative of Black Africa that has made an accord with Israel. Now, actually, if you actually visit a lot of Black Africa in the midsection of Africa, you'll find that the people are really quite pro-Israel. I was stunned at that in some of our visits years ago, even if the governments aren't always. Uh, Morocco has come into accord because of a recent agreement. And there's uh, Egypt in 1978 and nine. Syria, you know, is not in accord with Israel, but they're incapacitated by their own war internally. Lebanon, little country right here in the arrow. Lebanon is not really happy with Israel, but you know, some years, some week, some months ago, rather, there was a large explosion in Lebanon, indicative of the internal strife that they have there, and they have no interest or desire in an attack upon Israel. Everything is going the other way. And now with Saudi Arabia, the old king on the way out, the new prince on the way in, more and more, the identity is to make peace with Israel. But we've got to go on. You notice that with Egypt, in Egypt, and their experiences are such that it's not likely they're going to turn against Israel again. Now in Isaiah, the 19th chapter, verse 2, God says, I have set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. And that we have seen in recent years. You remember when Mubarak was ousted from power in Egypt by an election and the Muslim Brotherhood surprisingly took over. Now that shook, that got my interest. Was the Muslim Brotherhood going to take a stronger position against Israel? But as it turned out, a revolution against the Muslim Brotherhood surfaced and General Assisi took over and the military is now in control. But there are problems. The Egyptians are against the Egyptians and that is incapacitating them from moving against Israel. And I think that's the way it will remain, Isaiah 19 too. What about Syria, the other arch enemy? It was Egypt and Syria that made an alliance against Israel in 1973. Isaiah 17, 1, Damascus shall become a ruinous heap. And you know, because of the internal strife in Syria and in Damascus, the outskirts of Damascus today are basically a ruinous heap. Syria does not have the wherewithal, the capacity, maybe the motive, but that's all to go against Israel. They're incapacitated. Jordan, if Jordan ever thought to go against Israel again, it would be the ruin of their nation. I think they know that and they have no such interest. So I think we have already seen the last United Arab effort against Israel. But now we're going to go on to, go on to another area. And that is the land of Israel that we expect to be or not to be restored. Now, yesterday, Brother Len Grice spoke about the river of Egypt on the southern border, southwestern border of Israel. Now, here's a map of the river of Egypt. It's not the river kind of you might expect. 
This is the Wadi El Arish. Now, El Arish is a place on Egypt where this highland of the Sinai Peninsula drains through El Arish and into the Mediterranean. Now, that red area outlined is actually the watershed from that mountainous region, and it all drains into El Arish. So technically, all of this is the Wadi El Arish. It's dry in the summer and wet when it rains. You see that Israel butts up to this. They've already got the land to the river of Egypt in this respect. I don't think there's going to be more conflict there. There need not be any more. Now we go to the north. Now in the north, we have the Golan Heights. And the Golan Heights is part of the original land of Israel. And they received that back again in 1967, defended it in 1973. And now Israel has annexed that part of Israel as formally part of Israel. So there's no need to fight to get that part of their inheritance again. Now it is true that the original boundary of Israel takes you in a very narrow northern strip up to the river Euphrates. Israel didn't always have that, but in the days of David and Solomon, it is true they had that. Maybe something will come because of the conflict with Syria that will allow that extension, or maybe that extension will come in the millennial kingdom, or, or maybe, maybe circumstances are different and that will not be part of the finished land. Well, we'll see, we'll see. But what about the Gilead? Now, I don't mean the West Bank, the West Bank is here. Israel controls that and they control Gaza. Uh, that's no problem. I don't think you need another war to settle those issues. Maybe the kingdom. But you do have a concern about Gilead. Now, in Zechariah, the 10th chapter, verse 10, it says, I will gather Israel out of Assyria and bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon. Now, I think with Lebanon, that's already fulfilled because Mount Hermon in Lebanon really is already in possession by the Israelites as part of the Golan Heights. I don't think it means the country of Lebanon but rather the Lebanese Heights, the Golan Heights. But what about Gilead? Now it mentions Gilead and it's the only mention of Gilead prophetically that might suggest some concern. But if you go back to Genesis 31, 21, 23 and 25, when Jacob was coming back into the land of promise after 20 years, in that occasion, Gilead is mentioned three times. But Gilead refers there not to this area, but to the height of Gilead, which would be in the Golan Heights. Therefore, I suspect that the mention of Gilead as a restored possession already means the land in the Golan Heights that now is part of Israel. I don't think it's necessary for Israel to get this part of the land. Now, you may object and say, well, wait a minute. It is true that when Israel came into the promised land, although this part was never promised to Abraham, a vital point to keep in mind, nevertheless, Israel did settle two and a half tribes over here, not in the West Bank, sorry, those words are so big, but in the East Bank, the part that is the country of Jordan today. However, that was not the intent from the beginning. God actually told Israel, you have to skirt the land of Moab and the land of Ammon because I gave those to the children of Lot. It's not yours. But at that time, it had been overrun by Sihon and Og, two kings of the Amorites, and they were not willing to be peaceful to Israel. They attacked Israel, Israel won. So God said, okay then, you can take those two, that, that area as your at least temporary possession and the two and a half tribes settled that area. Those two and a half tribes represent Reuben, the firstborn, the church, Gad, the troop, the great company, half the tribe of Manasseh on either side of the Jordan, the ancient worthies that are the connecting link between the two parts of the kingdom. Well, those, those are spiritual classes, spiritual identifications, not literal land classes in symbology. But to add to this point, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 48, you will find the description of the land of Israel restored. It does not include anything east of the river Jordan. 
So the country today that is Jordan is not infringed by the description of the land of restored Israel in 1948. Dear brethren, I think we have seen the last Arab conflict that is of substance to drive Israel into the sea and destroy her. We have one looming problem, and that is Ezekiel 38. Now, going back here, Ezekiel 38. Here are the countries that are going to be involved. Gog from the north. Okay, I should go to a different map here. We have Gog from the north, usually considered to be Russia. I think that's true. We have Persia. That would be Iran. We have Libya. Libya is here west of Egypt. And then we have a place called Cush. Now, where is Cush? If you look under Cushite in Wikipedia, you might find, surprisingly, that it refers to the country of Yemen. And Yemen actually has biologically connections to this area of Africa where Ethiopia is. I don't think Ethiopia is going to attack Israel, but Yemen is an ally of Iran. They very well might. On the other side of the coalition, other side of the divide, are all of the Sunni Arab countries. They're not in sympathy with Iran, and they will not be part of that conflict. You remember in Ezekiel 38, after it lists the enemies that are ready to invade Israel, on the other side, it says, Tarshish, the old lion, and all the young lions, and Sheba and Dedan, say to the invading coalition, what are your intentions here? What are you trying to do? And I think that old lion is the British Empire. I think that's England, the young lions, America, Canada, Australia, maybe India, the old colonies that England has had. So, uh, Sheba and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, almost everybody says it's Saudi Arabia. So what's the big divide in the Arab world today? Sunni Shiite. Everybody's afraid of Iran, the Shiites. Yemen is linked with Iran, at least the Yemeni rebels. So I think that's the coalition. And then one more, and that's Gomer. Gomer are those people that were north of the Black Sea that migrated further to Germany. GRM, GMR, Gomer, Germany. I don't know that much about it. <laughs> I think that's what it is. And I think from Germany spread out all the Germanic tribes and took Western Europe. I think Western Europe is the final part of that coalition. And if you put Western Europe together with Russia and Turkey against Israel and Iran, you've got a coalition that is fearful indeed. Okay, we've got to go on. We're going to go on here to the end. We have two passages of scripture that we want to, want to deal with in closing. Isaiah 36, 37, and 38 is one of those. Now, Brother Len touched on this yesterday. These are three chapters all about the final invasion against Israel, the Sennacherib invasion, the fourth wave of the Assyrian invaders. And in chapter 36 of Isaiah, you have the threat delivered and the requirement by the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, unconditional surrender. That's what we require. That's Isaiah 36. Isaiah 37, Hezekiah the, teen, the, the, the king takes this letter to the temple of God. He falls on his face. He prostrates himself with the letter in front of him. He prays to God. God, only you can save us from this debacle. And God says, I will. They will not so much as shoot an arrow into the city. They woke up the next morning, 185,000 of the Assyrians dead on the ground. And the residue picked up their way and moved back to Assyria. And subsequently, even the king of Assyria was assassinated by his own sons. That's Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 38 we find out there's another problem at the same time. Hezekiah has been sick nigh unto death. And Israel, even if they didn't have an invasion to deal with, is sick nigh unto death because they have the systemic illness of sin that we all do. And they're going to die anyway. God gives them an extension of 15 years in his life. Remember that number. We'll see it in a moment. 
And then as a sign, he says the shadow on the stairway is going to return 10 degrees, 10 steps backward. Brethren, we have seen the shadow of God's judgment come back the 10 degrees, the 10 horns of Daniel chapter 7 that oppressed Israel for so long. That oppression is gone. That's a sign to us that God is going to deliver Israel in the final debacle. And finally, in verse 21 of chapter 38, Hezekiah is healed with a poultice of good figs applied to the boil on his back, drying out the infection of sin, metaphorically. The ancient worthies, though good figs, will come back and draw out the infection of, his, of sin from Israel. Our time is waning. We have one more passage. There it is, three chapters. We can't talk about it all. But in chapter three of Micah, you have a condemnation of the leaders of Israel and an assurance that judgment will follow. Zion will be plowed. And when the Babylonians and Romans came in, Zion literally, at least in the last case, was plowed. Micah chapter four, it talks about the blessings of the kingdom. Micah four, one through seven, is one of the most beautiful passages about the millennial kingdom. That's going to come in our day still pending. The kingdom described in verse eight, Israel is described as reborn as though a woman in labor gives birth to a new child. It says in Micah four, that would be in Babylon, metaphorically in the Roman world, in the bigger diaspora. And Israel has been reborn. They've come out of that tribulation. They are a nation again. And then the closing verses of Micah four, talk about Israel threshing their neighbors. That would be 1948, 1967, 1973. And then Micah chapter five. Well, we can't detail it too much, but for time, but in Micah five, five, that's when seven kings and eight princes intervene to deliver Israel from the very last debacle the Sennacherib invasion in Micah, prophetically the invasion of Gog in Ezekiel 38. And that's when it says, Israel shall be like the dew on the grass among the Gentiles, like the sweet rain after a storm. Israel is not going to fight in that battle, just like Israel didn't fight against Sennacherib, but God delivered them miraculously. So Israel will not fight in this final battle, they will be not like a vengeful marauding army, but like the dew from the grass and like a sweet, gentle rain after a storm, a refreshment to the world of mankind, Micah 5 or 7. Now, the rest of Micah chapter 5 recaps, and that's an important point to get to follow the flow of the prophecy. Micah 5, 8 through 15 recaps what Israel's been through how they have been an army that has done battle, and then how Israel is going to be purged, restored, all her idolatry gone. We're out of time. We can't go through those verses. We're going to close with this. But dear brethren, in summary, Israel has gone through three threats to her very national existence. In the three wars we have seen during the harvest, the final battle impends. Well, you know, in, in, in Acts chapter 27, we got a 14 days of storm to go through before the kingdom. Is that 14 years? I think so. So whenever you expect the kingdom, come back 14 years for that. It shows we have some time to go. I think a little over two decades, but the time is approaching. Israel's last debacle is approaching. Israel will bow and kneel in prayer as Joel 2 verse 12 and forward tells us. They will pray and prostrate themselves to God to deliver thy people. They'll look unto him with their little ones, their wives, their families and implore for deliverance. And then God will say, I will remove the Northern army far off from you. And then what we have been waiting for so many years will come the thousand year reign of Christ to bless every man, woman, and child who has ever lived. Brethren, the vision is wonderful. 
let us be faithful to our share and watch the events as they unfold to bring in the promised blessing of all the families of the earth. Thank you.